So um, to begin with, it's, it's very, very important that you know, we understand exactly why you know, TB, we are going to be talking about TB. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, you know, it estimates that you know, about 2 billion people actually are you know, infected worldwide you know, uh, with the, you know, tuberculosis itself. Uh, Zambia, Africa in general, you know, Asia, Europe, United States, all countries actually are all, you know, affected in some way by uh, um, pulmonary tuberculosis. And uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, they're about, you know, we, we saw an increase in HIV, you know, related, you know, uh, cases and obviously tuberculosis, you know, becomes one of the opportunistic kind of infections. And then we see a rise in uh, tuberculosis uh, in patients who are immunocompromised. Immunocompromised patients could not only be restricted to patients with, you know, HIV or H uh, AIDS itself. Uh, we're talking about patients maybe who might have, you know, organ transplants as well. You know, people who might have, you know, underlying, you know, um, um, conditions like, you know, diabetes, you know, uh, patients who are, you know, um, who sort of have some kind of, you know, social uh, deprivation, you know, alcoholics and the other people, homeless people, so, you know, uh, uh, prisoners and uh, people like that, you know, we do see an increase of um, uh, in cases of pulmonary tuberculosis, you know, uh, in such kind of population, actually. Um, we see that, you know, early diagnosis of uh, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis, you know, it's very, very important, even in Zambia or worldwide, for, for us to sort of uh, uh, let our clinicians sort of to effect early treatment. So maybe at least we could uh, help fight this, uh, you know, um, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. So despite the advances in the uh, uh, diagnostic uh, uh, ability and treatment, uh, TB still remains one of the commonest causes for morbidity and mortality, you know, from these kind of infectious causes. So it is very, very important that at least we take time to understand, you know, this TB. And then if you are involved, you know, in image interpretation or reporting of uh, TB, you know, at least maybe this talk is going to consolidate on what you already know or possibly you are going to sort of even possibly correct me if at all I say things that may not uh, make sense to you. And then in the, at the end of it all, we are going to have some kind of, you know, a conversation that is going to spur us into uh, delivering quality care to our esteemed clients, wherever you are based. So factors obviously that influence TB, you know, contact, co contraction of this TB, would include, like I said, you know, social economic status of, of, of patients. So we will look at, you know, uh, the homeless people, you know, where we, we, we congested, you know, uh, uh, societies or areas or communities. You know, we'll be looking at, you know, uh, you know, alcoholics and the people that are sort of uh, deprived of the social, uh, social, economic kind of, you know, uh, well-being, so to speak. Like I mentioned again, you know, uh, immune system integrity, if at all it has been affected or if it is low, you know, patients tend to have, uh, you know, contraction of this TB. Age, again, it's uh, one of the factors that we need to think about when we are reviewing case notes or maybe even examining our patients. So it is believed that, you know, the children, you know, particularly below the age of five, and the elderly population are much more, you know, uh, at risk of contracting tuberculosis itself. Uh, the general state of health, like I said, underlying conditions like diabetes, you know, uh, uh, transplants and all these kind of, you know, things, you know, people could have, uh, you know, uh, uh, they are at risk of actually contracting tuberculosis. Gender, it is believed that, you know, men, we, we tend to actually contract TB 
more than the female gender, as it were. And then there have been some studies which have implicated um, uh, African Americans, you know, Africans, uh, the Asian populations to be, you know, uh, at risk of contracting, you know, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. So remember, there, is, there are so many ways, you know, in which tuberculosis itself can manifest itself in the body. So uh, you can have TB involving the musculoskeletal, you know, anatomies. It TB, you know, involving the uh, uh, central nervous system, TB, you know, involving the, you know, the GI. So uh, we can talk about these maybe in the near future, but otherwise today I'm going to restrict myself to uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. So what are the common symptoms, you know, that, you know, um, the patient presents with? Though so our lovely doctors and nurses, obviously when they see these patients, patients, you know, uh, would pro would present with a productive cough. They may have hemoptysis itself, uh, coughing up of blood, you know, they may have weight loss, they will be fatigued, you know, they may have general body malaise, you know, fever and night sweats. All these, you know, symptoms, you know, um, the, the, the patients would present with these. So when we see these, the doctors and nurses obviously would uh, immediately maybe suspect this patient could have, uh, you know, uh, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, I must mention here that you know, sometimes patients with cancer, they may also present with hemoptysis and uh, uh, they may also present with weight loss. Uh, they may have, you know, maybe they may have a cough, but not, it could be, it could be non-productive. You know, uh, night sweats, I don't think they do, but otherwise, you know, some of these fact, you know, uh, uh, signs and symptoms here, they, they may be found in other, you know, presentations as well. So uh, once the doctors and nurses are suspecting, you know, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis, they may want to investigate this by the use of a chest x-ray. So what are the roles of the chest x-ray in pulmonary tuberculosis, you know, diagnosis? So basically, you know, a chest x-ray is, it is readily available, it is cheap, you know, you are able to acquire it within seconds and uh, with the level of education that you have, you should be able to pick up one or two things. So, uh, a, an initial chest x-ray is going to sort of determine or give you an overview of the extent of the disease itself. So you'll be able to see how spread is it on an x-ray. You, you would also use, uh, after you are happy with what you've seen, you may commence this patient on a treatment regime, you know, commensurate with the radiographic findings that have confirmed your suspicions of TB. After some time, uh, you would get a chest X-ray, obviously, to follow up that case. And then, again, you want to ascertain the efficacy of the treatment plan that you have, uh, the treatment that we've instituted. You know, a chest X-ray again is going to uh, look at the residue, you know, infection following therapy itself. You'll be able to assess, you know, use, by the use of a chest X-ray. Uh, so basically, I'm not going to go through all these you know, uh, roles that a chest x-ray would present in, in the evaluation of pulmonary TB. I must mention here that, you know, um, if a patient is being treated in Lusaka, you know, clinicians will know this patient because they understand, they know this patient anyway. So follow up is important because they do have an initial chest x-ray, which they may compare with the preceding, uh, I mean, follow up or subsequent imaging so that they actually can plan and see the efficacy or the response of the medication or the treatment that they've instituted for this patient. Uh, and like a patient is attending U UTH, U U U UTH, and then obviously they go somewhere else and then they have multiple chest x-rays. So it, 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 so the, the, our, we need to help our doctors that you know, they should, you know, patients are treated in one facility, so that at least, you know, imaging is done there for, for people to follow up and, and ascertain, you know, uh, what's going on and things like that. So this is very important uh, because if we do have the, 
uh, TB um, uh, screening programs in our country, that that's, that that's very, very important to, really to, to, to do. Okay, so uh, tuberculosis, pulmonary tuberculosis is actually caused by a, a microbacterium tuberculosis or bacilli. And it, it involves so many systems of the body, like I said, uh, uh, you know, it could go into the spine, you would be able to do spinal x-rays or MRI scans and every, you know, CT scans, you know, to look at the extent of the uh, involvement of the, you know, TB in the spine or whatever. But largely, you know, uh, the lungs are, are affected. I must mention here that um, um, this mycobacterium tuberculosis, you know, uh, agent, it, it can be transmitted from one person to the next, you know, predominantly if you're in close contact with the, with the, with the, with the, with a patient, or it can be caused, uh, you know, either when somebody coughs or they are singing, or you've got a room that is poorly ventilated, you know, these, you know, patients could, or you have spent a lot of time with a, with, with a patient with the TB, so again, exposure to this uh, mycobacterium, you know, um, may, 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 may encourage, you know, the, the spread of uh, uh, tuberculosis itself. So T, pulmonary TB can be classified into two. Okay, we, 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 we have what is called the primary, you know, TB or post-primary tuberculosis. Under the primary tuberculosis, this is actually seen uh, in the patients who have not had, you know, uh, previously exposed to the uh, the bacilli itself. So uh, it's much more common in infants and children, and uh, it also manifests, you know, as a parenchymal disease itself. So primary tuberculosis, you know, it. You know, people who have never been exposed to it, they, they get it, and then they, there is actually manifestation of the disease into the parenchyma itself. Then under post-primary uh, tuberculosis, these are patients who have had exposure to tuberculosis, and then the, 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 the bacilli may sort of, uh, you know, patients may get TB, get treated, and then it might it might it might heal, but it might still remain in the epical uh, segments of the upper lobes of the lungs, and then it might reactivate. So post-primary TB, sometimes it is called you know react, uh, reactive TB, or secondary TB because somebody has had you know uh, infection in the past, it reactivates, and then somebody would have. Um, you know, uh, uh, cavitations. When you do a chest X-ray, you will see cavitations in the uh, uh, on the chest X-ray. Um, yeah, and then you may have uh, fibrotic changes. You know, happening in the epicory epices of the lungs, and then you may also have bronchiectasis itself. So when you see all these features, if you're looking at an X-ray. When you pick up all these things, you'll be able to tell whether this is actually reactive TB or it is actually primary TB, which I'll explain as we continue. So when you do a chest X-ray, what are the some common things that you tend to see on, um, on a chest X-ray? So first of all, you, you might see lymphadenopathy. Uh, lymphadenopathy could or could it can only be the only sign that you see on the chest X-ray, lymphadenopathy. Forget about any parenchymal involvement or anything else. You may just see adenopathy, you know, uh, which is the only sign that you may see. This lymphadenopathy is quite common in children. In the elderly population, you may not even see lymphadenopathy at all. The chest X-ray is going to be clear. But you may see lymphadenopathy in patients who have got, let's say, AIDS or uh, immunocompromised. So you, you must be very careful, you know, how you are reporting this. 
Remember, lymphadenopathy could only be the only sign that you see on a chest X-ray. But adventure, if there is uh, parenchymal involvement, you will see parenchymal disease, like for example, you know, air space consolidations or air space opacities, which are quite irregular. Uh, it will define the kind of opacities. You, you might see uh, air bronchograms there. I will explain these things. So if you see all those things, you know, you are now, you know, getting happy or closer to your diagnosis. You, you might see, you know, pre-refusions with patients with the pleural TB, you know, they may have a unilateral distribution of pulmonary, you know, uh, of pleural effusions. Remember also that, you know, uh, bilateral pleural effusions are highly associated with the uh, left ventricular failure. So, oh, you know, unilateral pleural effusions, again, they are quite common in patients with the um, um, uh, malignancy, lung malignancy as well. So you must be very careful how you approach this. Otherwise, look for lymphadenopathy, look for parenchymal disease uh, um, uh, involvement, particularly airspace uh, consolidations, which I'll, I'll talk about, and pre-refusions. You may also have mineral uh, uh, distribution, uh, which is actually hematogenous kind of spread, uh, whereby you have uh, innumerable you know, mottling or um, uh, nodular opacities, you know, uh, spread across both lungs, quite discreet. You know, the, there is actually a lower lung predominance in these ones, but otherwise there is equal distribution of the uh, nodular densities uh, on the chest X-ray. You may also have lobar or segmental uh, atelectasis, you know, of the uh, of the lungs. Okay, so. Um, so this is very, very important that you, know, you actually understand the normal appearances of um, a chest X-ray. This is a normal PA chest X-ray taken you know, um, um, in a PA projection, like I said, and then we do have you know, very, uh, very good density. We are able to, let's say, see the anatomical markers and everything else. The chest X-ray has to be acceptable before you even start interpreting this X-ray anywhere. Any rotation of the image may sort of distort certain radiographic features. So you must be, you know, uh, happy that you know, you're looking at a, you know, a properly done chest X-ray, and then this is how it looks like. So review areas. Remember, I think they, uh, I, I, I presented this, uh, the introduction to chest reporting some time back. So I'm just going to go through the review areas you need to look at, okay? Review areas include the epices. Compare the left and the right epices there, okay? Look at the, the hilar points, okay? The hilum, the hilum, you know, have to be looked at. What are you looking for at the hilum? You are looking for three things at the hilum which could go wrong. You're looking at the density of the hilar points. You're looking at the position of the hilar points themselves. Remember that um, the left hilum is always higher than the right hilum. Okay, uh, it should be the case that you know the right right hilum can be at the same level as the left hilum itself. It should not be the case that the right hilum is above the left one. For example, if I moved the right hilum and then placed it over here, that is an abnormal finding. So something is terribly wrong with that patient. So we need to start looking for what is causing the elevation of the hilum. So assess the position, the density, and the size of the hilar points, and then you know assess those ones. Look at the retrocardiac space, both on the right and on the left side here. You're looking for space occupying lesions or mass lesions that could be hiding behind the heart. You also look at the subdiaphragmatic regions here. You're looking for things that could be hiding beneath the diaphragm. Remember the posterior lung actually goes beyond what you can see here. You can see nodular opacities or a destructive um, uh, malignancy or anything that could be you know, hiding beneath there. Sometimes people tend to have what they call bogdelic hernias, which are quite common you know, on the medial aspect of the, 
of the uh, of the hemidiaphragms, they should not be confused for anything abnormal. So basically, that is in a nutshell the anatomy that you need to look out for here. So um, the hyla points is very very important because your, your your diagnosis of TB is going to lie around the hyla points first of all. Then two, they remember in my first introduction, I spoke about certain lines that you need to know before you even start looking at, at the chest x-ray. One of the lines I'm going to talk about is what is called the paratracheal stripe. Okay, the right, right, we do have the left and the right side. We don't use the left paratracheal stripe. People don't even talk about it. Books don't even talk about it. They never mention it. They only talk about the right paratracheal stripe. So the right paratri paratracheal stripe is just the, 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 the intimate relationship between the trachea and the middle border of the the right lung. So where, uh, where you can see the mouth here, that is what is called the paratracheal stripe. The right paratracheal stripe should not measure more than four millimeters. So if it is actually more than four millimeters, you should start querying what is going on with this enlargement of the paratracheal stripe. Remember, if we do have that enlargement of the paratracheal stripe, it could mean that the patient has got lymphadenopathy or they may have you know, lymphoma also and things like that. So, you should be guided by the clinical history given, which is very, very important when uh, justifying a chest X-ray. So remember the right paratracheal stripe one, then two, remember the hyla points. It's very, very important. And then one thing that I forgot to mention here is the iotopulmonary window here. The iotopulmonary window here, sometimes you can have a bulge you know, a mass which could be lobulated, which could sort of be showing its ugly head around there, which would possibly, you know, indicate that you've got lymph node enlargement or something growing at the iotopulmonary window itself. So, this is uh, an example of what you could see on a chest X-ray. You, you may have consolidations that are quite, uh, you know, epical in nature. You, you may have cavitations, uh, which are quite common in reactive TB. Consolidations are quite common in, you know, primary TB, post-primary TB. You can have high lymphadenopathy, which is quite common in uh, um, uh, primary TB. Uh, and you tend, you tend not to see high lymphadenopathy in reactive or post-primary TB. So if you are going to be relying solely on high enlargement in post-primary TB, you may not see lymphadenopathy. It will be absent. And, you know, patients other than children, this high uh, enlargement might be absent. So, uh, and, the, and yet the patient has got, you know, TB. So you, you must really, I'll talk about the, the things that you need to look out for anyway, one second. You may, you may or may not see pleural effusion, but, but otherwise pleural effusion, that is, you know, uh, patients with, you know, uh, pleural TB, patients might present with a, 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 a unilateral, you know, vision itself. Some patients could also have, you know, um, pericardial effusion, you know, um, you know, when you do the heart, do a chest X-ray, you would see that you know, the, the density of the heart may not be uniform. You know, you could have more or less like, you know, a white tissue, an increased density, you know, uh, appearance of the, of, the, of the heart. And you will be able to, you will be failing to actually appreciate the vasculature behind the heart. So that is one of the, uh, you know, features that you can use to say whether somebody has got fluid around the heart. Around the heart, is because you you tend to 
to, to lose the controls of the, uh, the vasculature on the uh, retrocardiac space. Mirror the TB, you know, obviously, you know, they are quite mortal, uh, discrete, innumerable, uh, small nodular opacity, opacities spread across both lungs, so to speak. And then the granulomas are just the calcified, what we call the gone, the, the gone, the gone focus. So you have, you've got the gone focus there, or tuberculomas, uh, that they are just calcified, you know, residue uh, um, areas of um, you know active TB that have calcified. They are called you know granulomas and stuff. You may have fibrosis of the you know of the of the epices you know, uh, post-primary post TB. This is an example of um, uh, how a consolidation looks like. There is a whitish airspace opacity, you know, uh, which is irregular, and you tend to see air bronchograms around. An air bronchogram is just, a, you know, uh, there is actually consolidation. There is an airspace, you know, opacity itself, like what we have here on the mass here. But the, the, the bronchial walls are patent. So there is actually air that is actually flowing through that mass. So you see, you see that consolidation, you know, which depicts, you know, uh, uh, an infection. So infections, uh, or consolidations with an air bronchogram are uh, infective in nature. If you look at this one mass here, there is no air bronchogram here. So it is one homogeneous air space opacity with no air bronchogram. So you know this is actually a mass itself. So masses and nodules are similar, except that you know, a, a, a nodule is less than three millimeters in diameter and anything above three millimeters is actually a mass. So a nodule may not attract a CT scan where you work, but a mass would possibly attract a CT scan because you want to actually uh, rule out, you know, presence of a, a lesion. So uh, if I saw a nodule here and then I measure it, it is less than three millimeters, I would keep an eye on that nodule so maybe this patient becomes a candidate for maybe you know three months, six months, nine months, twelve you know yearly kind of reviews to just to look at the the, the behavior of a nodule. If the mod nodule stays the same after a year, I would discharge this patient. I said, no, this is just a benign entity. I don't need to worry about anything at all. So because I've been monitoring it. It is consistent. It is actually not increasing in size. So this patient can go home. This is just a benign entity. If it increases in size, then you should be worried that you know, at least you're dealing with some kind of a mass lesion here, which might need possibly a, a CT scan. Possibly it could be, you know, a, a malignant process, you know, going on. And then we've got interstitial um, uh, shadowing, which obviously we have uh, reticulations, uh, reticular shadowing you know, whereby you do have the, 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 the scaffolding that holds the lung parenchyma, you know, sort of getting enhanced, you know, you, you, so you, you, you may have interstitial shadowing, you know, uh, not per se the parenchymal involvement, but the interstitial tissues of the lungs could also be, you know, involved, you know, uh, uh, in, in any pathology that obviously, you know, affects the, the, the lungs. Then atelectasis is just the collapse or failure of the part of the lung or the total lung, you know, if, if it collapses and it's not able to, 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 uh, to expand. So that would be atelectasis. Atelectasis per se, somebody has had a surgical intervention, they may have linear atelectasis, which you obviously you're not worried about, you know, it's okay, you know, this could be maybe just post-surgical uh, atelect atelect atelectasis. Um, if somebody has had, let's say, is an ITU patient, or somebody has had uh, um, has swallowed a coin, you know, and then it gets, you know, the many bronchus, you know, gets, you know, blocked, you may see part of the lung actually collapsing. So that would be, there's going to be a telectasis actually arising from that. 
somebody could have mucus plugging an ITU patient, you know, the mucus plugging itself can cause, you know, uh, atelectasis, lobar atelectasis, you know, and things like that. Somebody could have an endobronchial, you know, uh, carcinogenesis, which can cause, you know, uh, uh, atelectasis, you know, distal to uh, the site of the, the, the insult itself. Okay, so this is actually a TB manifestation in an adult. We can see that, you know, on this ch chest X-ray, the normal chest X-ray, we can see that, you know, we can, uh, the, 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 the lung, the, the lingual aspect of the lung has been clearly demonstrated. We are able to see every contour of this, of this, um, uh, of this chest. But when it comes over to this here, we, we lose, there is obscuration of the, 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 the lingual aspect by the ill-defined, diffuse kind of you know, airspace opacity that is actually involving the upper lobe. Remember, it is only the left upper lobe that, that makes contact with the, with the, with the heart itself. The, the lower lobe has got no contact with the lower lobe at all, you know. So uh, it is the, 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 the lower lobe which obviously communicates or attach, that is attached to the, to the hemidiaphragm. So we can see that you know, this large, diffuse, ill-defined airspace opacity, you know, involving largely the left upper lobe has got diffuse or air, uh, air bronchograms within it. So we can tell that no, this is actually an infective cause. And in this case here, uh, this patient has got a parenchymal involvement of the, uh, of the chest uh, in a patient with the uh, primary TB. Okay. Look at this. Again, parenchymal involvement. We see that, you know, the the left, the right upper lobe here, there is actually a mass, you will define the mass that is actually involving the right upper lobe with enlargement of the right hilum here. If we compare the two hilar points here, you can see that the left hilum here is actually preserved, very good density, it's not enlarged, and then it has maintained its natural position. But when we move over to the right side here, we do see an enlarged, an enlarged hilum here, actually a higher density than the, in comparison with the left side here. So there is lymphadenopathy here with an airspace opacity involving the right upper lobe. I must mention here, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen here, that uh, um, pulmonary tuberculosis always it, it has got a predilection to involve, to actually affect the right upper lobe. The reason is that, uh, this is what the books argue. They, they, they say that, you know, because there is proper ventilation, you know, the, the uh, ventilation in the upper, uh, upper lobes here, you know, it, it, the TB tends to go to the epices, particularly the right side. And then because of poor lymphatic drainage itself, you tend to have, the predominantly uh, uh, upper lobe distribution of pulmonary tuberculosis. So if you were a clinician, radiographer, whatever you do, you know, whatever you are, whatever you do, when you do a chest X-ray, what are you looking for? You are looking for, first of all, lymphadenopathy, enlarge the hilum, particularly the right hilum, hilum itself. The left could also be involved, but you are really looking at the right side itself, looking at the, the size, the density. You are also looking at the right upper lobe. Any airspace you know, opacity involving the right upper lobe should be interrogated, particularly if, again, you have got enlargement of the right paratracheal stripe here. So lymph node in the mediastinum here, lymph node enlargement at the hilum and airspace opacity to the right upper lobe, which could also be on the left side here. So all these features here are talk, speaking to active pulmonary tuberculosis. Remember, lymphadenopathy. Remember, parenchymal involvement and 
you know, cavitations will come later. You know, we'll, we'll talk about those ones and stuff like that. Look at this X-ray again. We do have the right upper lobe predominance. There is actually an ill-defined airspace opacity with a bit of air bronchograms around here. Now it is actually on the inferior border here. It is actually bordering the uh, major fissure or the uh, ob uh, horizontal fissure here because the oblique fissure comes down here. So this is the horizontal fissure or the minor fissure uh, on the inferior aspect here. Look at the hilum here. There is enlarged hilum here with elevated or elevation of the minor fissure with an airspace opacity involving the right upper lobe here. Again, classic example of uh, parenchymal involvement in a patient with uh, a pulmonary tuberculosis. Look at this one again. We do have an airspace opacity here. Air bronchograms are, are, are present. The right upper lobe is involved again in this patient. Again, the paratracheal stripe here is maintained. The hilar points, you know, I think they are okay, except the fact that, you know, this hilum has been pulled upwards here because of the, you know, possibly reduced lung volume to the right upper lobe here. So remember, remember, I must mention here that, you know, you've got to understand the normal anatomy before you even start calling things like, you know, there is uh, uh, loss of volume to the right upper lobe. So what, what has caused this hilum to be moved up here is because of these changes going on here. There is some kind of fibrotic change with active, you know, uh, uh, active TB, reduced lung volume, which is actually sort of pulling the, 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 right, hem, the right hilum, you know, super, superiorly, so to speak. So again, parenchymal involvement of active pulmonary tuberculosis. We see the same feature here to the left upper lobe here. There is an ill-defined, you know, indistinct airspace opacity involving the left upper lobe here. So this again is an example of uh, primary tuberculosis. It has got a predominance in the upper lobes. Remember here, we do, the paratracheal stripe here is maintained. The hilum here is okay. Possibly the hilum on the left side here is all right. So do not just rely on lymphadenopathy to see it. If you see it, that's good. In the absence of the lymphadenopathy, we've got parenchymal involvement, particularly the upper lobes. This patient definitely has got uh, you know, uh, tuberculosis based on X-ray findings. Otherwise, you know, doctors and nurses were going to do the uh, AFB kind of, you know, uh, uh, sputum kind of, you know, assess uh, tests and things like that to confirm their suspicions. Radiologically speaking, we are looking at a patient with left upper lobe airspace consolidation or involvement in a patient with the, you know, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. So look at, Look at the hilum here. The left hilum is actually enlarged. There, and there is actually a lobulated kind of you know, lymph node enlargement at the iotopulmonary window here. Notice also that you know, on the right paratracheal stripe here is also enlarged. When you see these appearances here, they are speaking to the presence of uh, uh, um, um, uh, active, pulmonary tuberculosis. So the paratracheal stripe here, remember I said it has to be four, it shouldn't be more than four millimeters. If it is more than that, you should start getting worried. Autopulmonary window involvement. And sometimes you may have, let me just go back to the, to that chest X-ray I showed you one second. Um, so, the trachea bifurcates into the right and left main bronchi. And then this is what is called the subcranial angle. The subcranial angle, some books say that it shouldn't be more than 90 degrees. 
if it is more than 90 degrees, something is actually either pu pulling it up or something's growing down here, like subocrino nodes, lymph nodes. So subocrino lymph nodes could grow down here and then they will push. There's going to be splaying of the carino angle here to be more than 90 degrees. So you start assessing the subocrino angle here. Another feature which can cause the enlargement or widening of the subocrino angle will be um, enlargement of the left atrial um, atrium actually. If the left atrium is enlarged, it's going to actually push the subocrino angle the other side. So, so many factors can cause that. Uh, okay, when, you, when we talk about cardiology staff, we'll come back and talk about those ones and things like that, okay? So, uh, so, so subocrino angle here, uh, it, it might sort of uh, enlarge the lymph node here to actually splay the subocrino angle, which will be more than 90 degrees. So we see the bilateral you know, lymphadenopathy here, you know, both the hilar points are actually enlarged with the uh, widened you know, paratracheal stripe here in a patient with active TB. When you do a cross-sectional uh, uh, CT scan, you can see that there is actually a very large lymph node around here with a necrotic center here. So this is actually a, a, a lymph node, paratracheal lymph node enlargement with a central necrosis in, in a patient with the, you know, t active TB. And then we see here, the patient has got a bit of pleural effusion uh, on the posterior aspect of the, of the, of, of, of the uh, right lung here. Notice that the left lung here, there is actually absence of a pleural fusion, but we can see a pleural fusion, you know, in, in this on the, on this line here, confirming that you know, at least we are looking at uh, uh, somebody with the primary tuberculosis. So lymphadenopathy is seen in about ninety six percent of children and for the three percent of adult, you know, with those that have got you know. Uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. Typically, unilateral you know, hyaline enlargement, like I said, a widening of the right paratracheal stripe. And, uh, uh, and please remember that you know, the paratracheal stripe enlargement could be the only sign that could be present on a chest X-ray, or you could have hyaline enlargement. So one, or, or you are lucky if all these things are present, but paratracheal stripe, you know, enlargement or hyla point enlargement, these could be the only signs that you could see on a chest X-ray to confirm the geographic presence of, uh, you know, pulmonary tuberculosis. Look at these, you know, hyla point, lobulate, lob lobulated, you know, uh, hyla point enlargement and enlargement of the right paratracheal stripe here in a patient with, uh, you know, active TB. If I was looking at a female patient, maybe age 45, you know, I would be querying, you know, sarcoidosis here, or possibly in a, in a young patient, I can be, you know, maybe I can be, it, it, this can also mimic, you know, uh, um, um, an anterior mass, you know, uh, possibly lymphoma could also be, you know, suspected in, in, in this patient. So this patient, if you've got CT scan, you know, wherever you work, this patient justifies, you know, you doing a CT scan with contrast enhancement. So pre-refusions, they manifest, you know, uh, three to seven months after initial exposure. I must say this there for that, you know, when somebody's got TB, parenchymal clearance would take a long period of time. The manifestations of parenchymal involvement may take a long time for the lungs to clear because the clearance takes long, really. You might be frustrated, you know, that I think you no, know, we are not making any headways, but clinically speaking, so the clinical appearance of the picture, the picture, the clinical picture of the patient will speak volumes to reassure that, you know, to reassure you that you know, at least the treatment is actually being effective. Even the lymph node enlargement, takes an 
awful long time for these appearances to actually, you know, uh, clear off. So uh, you must be patient as you, you know, treat and examine these patients. So prenatal effusions, they take about three to seven months after initial exposure to the uh, bacilli itself. And usually, like I said, they are usually, you know, unilateral and, you know, complications for these would include, you know, uh, empyema formation, you know, uh, fistulization. The fistulization here is whereby you do have the pleural space, you know, communicating with the br br bronchial, the bronchial, br br bronchioles and things like that. So you tend to have, you know, that kind of, you know, fistulization. So when that happens, you know, uh, patients have, have got very bad outcomes, really, when fistulization come, you know, uh, happens, you know, uh, it's because, uh, you know, things are getting a little bit worse. And then these patients would actually be coughing blood and things like that uh, because of the vascular involvement, you know, in, in this case. Um, you know, bone erosions are quite, you know, uh, rare. Uh, in TB, uh, you don't get these kind of you know erosions. If you if you had bone erosions, you may not be looking at possibly TB. So you'll be looking at things like maybe uh, uh, the destructive bone process or uh, metastatic kind of you know uh, appearance or clinical picture, or you may be maybe looking at the coarctation of the of the iota, you know, particularly you know the, those things, you know. So. Uh, the, the clean, if you see bone erosions, you'll be looking at something different. Uh, so TB, I'll throw it at the back of my mind, but I'll be looking for other things that could be causing, you know, bone erosions and things like that. So these will be the complications of pleural effusion, uh, you know, empyema formation, and uh, you know, fistulization itself. So this is an example of uh, a moderate, you know, pleural effusion. So if you are involved in the uh, reporting of these x-rays, it's very, very important that you actually quantify the amount of clinic, uh, uh, the amount of pleural fusion that you, you the, our clinicians, the, our doctors, the nurses, everybody that is involved in treating this patient would want to have an idea of the quantification of the pleural fusion. So, you know, it's either it is actually mild or maybe small, moderate or large pleural fusion. So in this case here, this is actually a moderate loculated pleural effusion on the, on the left side here, unilateral you know, uh, distribution of the pleural effusion here. So remember we said you know, in TB, usually the um, uh, pleural effusion is usually unilateral. If it is bilateral, you, you'll be looking at maybe things like you know, heart failure and things like that. But otherwise you know, in TB, it is usually you know, unilateral distribution of the pleural effusion itself. And then you see this pleural effusion in almost 25% of these, you know, TB uh, cases. Post-primary TB. So uh, post-primary TB, like I said, um, patients may have had TB in the past, and then you know the uh, the TB goes into the latent stage. You know it hides in the you know uh, epical segments of the lungs or segmental kind of involvement, and then after some time it reactivates. And then one of the hallmarks of uh, post-primary TB is cavitations. Cavitations are quite common in the post-primary TB. So when you see a patient who has had um, TB in the past, do an x-ray, then you see a cavitation, uh, then you know this is actually post-primary TB you're dealing with. Uh, it also has the uh, upper lobe predominance, and there is usually absence of lymphadenopathy itself. So lymph node enlargement, forget about it. So you look at um, cavitations, which are quite common in post-primary you know, TB. I think I will talk about that. I think I've got a slide there. Then we do have mirrored TB itself. Uh, we look at the discrete multiple, you know, nodular densities spread across evenly in both lungs. This is how it looks like here. If somebody has had chicken pox or varicella pneumonia, you may have a similar distribution of uh, um, um, nodular densities 
somebody who is a minor, you know, they've got silicosis or pneumoconiosis, they may also have a similar distribution like this. But how do you differentiate them from one another? So for mirror TB here, these nodular densities here, they are not high, um, highly opaque. So if they are highly opaque in appearance, then you are dealing with uh, uh, non-mirror TB. You're dealing with something like in a pneumoconiosis or silicosis, depending on uh, the occupation of this patient. And uh, um, varicella pneumonia also can present you know, a, in such a format like this, but the densities are totally different. So basically, these nodular densities, they tend to measure about two to three millimeters in diameter, and uh, they tend to have more predominance in the uh, lower lobes of both lungs. But the, when you see mirrored TB, usually uh, the prognosis for such patients is quite, say, quite bad. So this is actually hematogenously spread, and we must be able to pick it up, you know, as and when we will see it. If in your hospital, you know, uh, there is no radiologist around, you only see mirror TB, try and speak to the doctors, maybe to, to see that obviously, you know, you've seen something quite, uh, you know, of concern, you know, possibly you're dealing with maybe mirror TB, you know, maybe these patients could be triaged in your facility and possibly given some kind of, you know, um, uh, some kind of preferential kind of treatment because of the, uh, the poor prognosis for these kind of patients, really. So mirror TB usually seen in the elderly patients, you know, infants uh, are not exempt. And, uh, you, know, you know, they're quite common in immunocompromised patients and they tend to manifest, you know, six months, you know, uh, 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 after exposure. So, which means therefore that you know, this mirror TB will have had time to actually cause a bit of devastation to the to the lungs, and uh, uh, by six months, obviously they will have done a lot of damage. So, when we see them, obviously these patients will be weak, elderly, you know, infants they will be crying. So, at least, you know, because we all work in the hospitals, you know, and then we have been called to serve mankind. So sometimes you can just, you know, maybe drop whatever you're doing and possibly, you know trying to triage this patient, you know, because these are our relatives, these are our brothers and sisters. So uh, just get out of their way, really, and then obviously speak to someone to see these patients, because obviously, you know, they, uh, I'll feel good if I told you did that, really, because uh, we need to help our, our brothers and sisters, you know, who, who have got these kind of you know, things and stuff. So in, in, my, uh, in some instances, the chest x-ray will be quite normal. You may not see you know, uh, no lymphadenopathy, nothing at all. But, you know, if you are really worried about immediate TB, I think people will do bloods, they will do uh, other tests, maybe just to see the presence of, uh, you know, uh, the, the bacilli, you know, or kind of infection in the, in the blood and things like that. But after six months, people will see this manifestation of immediate TB and things like that. Like I said, again, you know, immediate TB uh, has got a very poor, you know, prognosis. Again, another case of mirror TB here in a patient with in a patient with who is actually immunocompromised, uh, quite common again in the pediatric population. We see you know nodular densities, you know, discrete, multiple uh, uh, nodular densities spread across in both lungs with the lower lung you know, predominance bilaterally. So this again is um, a classic example of mirror you know, distribution of mirror. TB. Okay, we see the you know nodular densities again spread across you know the the entire left lung here. You know again mirror TB manifestation. You know uh, uh, exoscan of the the same patient. We see nodular densities that are evenly distributed throughout the lung parenchyma. You know uh, you know uh, uh, obviously supporting the argument that the patient has got you know mirror TB. Look at that child. Okay, this child, you know, again, crying, raised body temperature, all these kind of things. When you see these again, you know, you know, again, is some that should actually sort of cause you to, you know, uh, expedite, you know, um, and let someone know. Because our doctors are quite busy, doctors, nurses are quite busy as well. You know, sometimes they may be on call, you know, they're tired and things like that. So 
then it may take them maybe two or three days for them to come and review this x-ray. So when you see it again, you know, uh, you know, try and get someone to maybe review this patient. Uh, you know, I highlight that they found something that, that's quite significant. It is, it's quite, uh, quite, quite important. Thank you, palliative care, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, Marie Rose, thank you, yeah, thank you. Uh, guys, there are very, very important comments being shared here on the screen. They're very, very important. I'm learning as well. At least take time to read through the, 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 the comments being, being posted in the chat lines there too. Thank you, uh, Maria Ross. Thank you. Yeah. So again, you know, mirror distribution for uh, mirror TB there. So uh, I think I didn't arrange the, uh, the slides properly. Uh, okay, this is the uh, post uh, primary TB. I was talking about, you know, uh, cavitations um, and the characteristics of the cavitations. It says that you know there's going to be the wall surrounding. Goodness me, the the wall surrounding the the cavity itself might be thick and irregular. Uh, there can be multifocal kind of you know uh, cavitations. Um, I'll talk about this in the in in the, in the next slide. And then usually there is no uh, 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 lymphadenopathy in the post primary uh, TB. Look at this x-ray here. This is a patient with a cavity here. So if you look at the characteristics of this cavity here, it's actually in the left upper lobe itself. Though, it, because the reason I'm saying this is because it is only the left upper lobe that borders with the lingual aspect of the lung. So in this case, this is the epical segment of the, um, 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 uh, or oh, it's the lingual aspect of the lung. So you look at the, the cavity here. It has got a very thick, quite irregular border around it. It's very thick, irregular cavity here. If the same cavity was very thin, well-defined, it would mean something different. It could be cancer. So the differentiation between, if those of you that are possibly medical students, or if you've got a patient and then this can come in an exam to differentiate between, you know, cavitations in TB and the cavitations in cancer. You have got to look at the border of the mass that you look, the cavity you're looking at. So the cavity in, in cancer, it will be very thin, well-defined, and that's just cancer. In, in TB, it's going to be thick, irregular kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know cavitation itself. This is the same patient uh, after some time, we do have the same cavity here, you know, very thick and possibly an air fluid level here, you know, uh, inside, uh, raising the possibility of possibly, you know, infection uh, within the cavitation itself. So these kind of features are quite common in post-primary TB. Notice here that we don't have lymphadenopathy here. The, the hyalur points, they are just intact, good size, good density, the positions are just fantastic. We don't have, we don't have the enlargement of the paratracheal stripe here. Everything else is intact. All we have here is just the cavity itself. When you do have that in a post-primary patient, that is actually post-primary or reactive TB. Where I work, we have what is called the TB clinic. So most of these patients would come with different types of you know, x-rays that you are looking at. So we are really uh, on top of things, you know, trying to pick out, you know, all these kind of things. So they want to see reactive TB, you know, active. It, it becomes really a puzzle for you to start, you know, differentiating all these things and stuff. So the more you look at these x-rays, the more you become confident to see what you're dealing with anyway. So in this case here, we are dealing with a post-primary TB, you know, with the capitations. CT, coronal scan, we can see, you know, an epical mass here, thick wall with a cavity, very, you know, nice cavitation around to the right apex of the, of the, the, to the left, to the apex of the left lung here. So everything around here is all consolidation with the, um, 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 a 
cavity, cavitating lesion here. Some patient look at the thick wall and uh, cavitating lesion to the apex of the right lung there. Different patient, sorry. Look at this. We do have a, a thick walled cavitating lesion to the right, to the left upper lobe here with corresponding cavitating lesion to the right apex here. So remember, TB has got the predominance to affect the apices of the lungs. Do a chest X-ray. Look for cavitations in post-primary. Look for uh, lymph node enlargement, paratracheal stripe enlargement, and things like that. So in this case here, post-primary TB, you know, uh, is suspected here. Again, there is fibrosis. Fibrosis occurs because of lung scarring. Some people just call it lung scarring. Again, you know, doctors, nurses, or, or, or whoever is involved in TB clinics, they would send an, a patient for um, um, lung scarring, you know, chest X-ray for lung scarring, you know, uh, following TB treatment and things like that. You know, what has happened here is that, you know, the lungs have lost you know, their elasticity. So everything here is all fibrotic. If you look at these x-rays here, there is actually loss of lung volume bilaterally. You know, the, the lungs have, have lost elasticity, so the volume has compressed. So this patient, you know, if, if they are saying that they, once they lie flat on their back, they can't breathe properly, they've got to lie, you know, or maybe on four or five pillows, so at least, you know, they, it gives them a bit of, you know, leeway to breathe. It's because of maybe, you know, fibrotic changes that have occurred as a result of previous infection. So cavitating lesions are quite common and lung fibrosis is quite common in patients with the, you know, TB. In fact, one of the complications of TB is lung fibrosis. Like in this patient, we do have reduced bilateral lung volume, you know, bilaterally, possibly predominantly, you know, to the left lung itself. Yes, we do actually encounter thick walls in necrotizing squamous cell carcinoma. Yes, we do. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, yes, 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 we do. So basically well, what you tend to actually find is the characteristics of the walls themselves. Sometimes, again, you could have an espageloma itself, which could also mimic, you know, uh, which could also be an imposter to what we're talking about, really. I'm just asking a question, actually, guys, here. Yes, we can, we can get that. And for you to differentiate that, I think a patient might need maybe a CT scan to uh, possibly, uh, you know, discriminate you know, uh, between those two kind of, you know, uh, 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 entities. Yes, we can. So we, we tend to have, so in this x-ray here, we are having uh, cavitations, oh, come on. We're having um, cavitations and uh, fibrotic changes bilaterally, you know, um, uh, on this chest x-ray. So latent infection or TB, Right. So uh, latent TB or infection, again, uh, uh, is, is you. So the, the, it's, it's a bit difficult, really, because the, this patient might have might have the infection, but there may not be any radiographic or clinical evidence to support the, the suspicions. But when you do a chest X-ray, you, you might see uh, features like, you know, uh, uh, traction bronchiectasis, which is difficult to see on a chest X-ray, unless unless the bronchiectasis is actually infected. So uh, bronchiectasis obviously is just the uh, widening of the bronchial walls, and then you know they're dilated, permanently dilated, and then you may have thick walls you know, of the of the bronchial walls and things like that. So sometimes on a chest X-ray. You, you might see what we call the cylindrical bronchiectasis itself, or you may have traction bronchiectasis, which you might see, you know, possibly in the lung upper zone, the upper lobe, upper lobes, yes. And uh, sometimes, 
you know, to the lower lobes as well. So um, you may need the CT scan again to uh, establish that fact. So uh, you are lucky to see, uh, you know, bronchiectasis on a chest X-ray. Uh, normally, I have seen bronchiectasis if there is, you know, super added kind of, you know, infection or pneumonic kind of, you know, causes, you know, there. So you may have nodular opacities which are, you know, uh, indistinct or they are coalesced together, you know, on a chest X-ray and largely, you know, you also have, you know, fibrosis. But again, I must mention that, you know, it is really, really difficult to pick up, you know, latent, you know, infections. You know, I, I wouldn't say that you know, it's, it's easy, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's quite uh, uh, difficult to, 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 to pick up really, you know. And uh, uh, so another example of um, um, uh, lung uh, fibrosis, we have the epices here, you know, there are fibrotic changes, you know, bilaterally, you know, in this patient. But again, remember that, you know, by epical fibrotic changes are also common in the patients who may have um, um, radio, radiotherapy because of, you know, existing maybe lung cancer of some sort. So these kind of, you know, changes could also be seen in, in, in such kind of, you know, patients with the, you know, uh, history of um, 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 radiotherapy, so to speak. But otherwise, you know, for lung fibrosis in a patient with, you know, uh, um, 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 previous TB, you may have, you know, uh, uh, scarring, lung scarring to the epicenter of the, of the lung itself. So these are the complications of uh, TB, you know, um, uh, itself, you know, um, so I think I've spoken about these ones. Um, okay, uh, I may come back to explain this one at some stage. I've just forgotten actually, uh, my apologies on this one here, but otherwise these are the complications of, uh, you know, of um, uh, TB itself. Thank you very much. Sorry for taking your time, but otherwise, the, you know, that was the, uh, the presentation I had for you on the, pulmonary TB itself. So we do have some comments and uh, uh, let me just have a look at uh, some of the um, comments. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, one second. One second. Um, just going through the comments. One second. Uh, 